<clears throat> Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, or I should say good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our webinar, Embracing New Partnerships that Advance Locally-Led Development Through Private Sector Engagement. I'm Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I just want to orient you to the Zoom webinar. On the bottom of your screen, you're going to see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the toolbar. It's on the left. Please indicate who your question is for, and you can ask questions throughout our event. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. Lastly, we're recording the webinar, and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they're available. That does include the slide deck. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Sarah Rose. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session on embracing new partnerships that advance locally led development through private sector engagement. I want to begin by extending a big thank you to the USAID resilience and food security folks, as well as the AgriLinks team for pulling this event together. Uh, we are approaching the end of localization month at AgriLinks, and this is a great opportunity to really reflect on the stories, the examples, uh, the lessons shared. And this is also a great opportunity to do a deep dive into the intersection of localization and private sector engagement. There's also a key moment for this discussion because USA just released its new policy framework a few weeks ago. And this framework highlights priority partnerships, which include both deepening our engagement with the private sector and expanding our support for locally led development. And these two things are linked. And indeed, USAID has a long history of engagement with local private sector actors as drivers of long-term sustainable development results. So through localization, one of USAID's primary goals is to embrace local systems practice. So taking account of the key local actors and relationships, uh, local systems practices about understanding power dynamics and incentives and really recognizing the priorities, the capacities, the ideas and the challenges that local actors face. And this kind of system systems thinking really includes private sector actors and their roles, their relationships, their contributions and their obje objectives as well. The local private sector is rooted in communities and invested in local markets. And beyond that, there are social ties and social motivations at play that can create incentives for the local private sector to expand market linkages as well. So in pursuit of advancing locally led development, USAID has also committed to shifting more direct funding and more power to the local actors who are driving change in their own communities. Now these goals are related, but distinct. So control of funding is an important aspect of ownership, but it's only part of the story. Fundamentally, the ability to exercise influence over how development happens in one's own community is really at the heart of locally led development. So we need to make sure that our programs and our relationships create space for local actors to really exercise leadership over priorities, activities, the way we implement and the way we define and measure results. So our engagement with the local private sector can contribute to both of these goals. We can partner directly with local firms in support of shared outcomes, but even outside of direct partnerships, we also must make sure that we are engaging private sector interests in defining our work and shaping the work that we do. So USA private sector engagement policy, it, it's now five years old, but it's still relevant. It directs USAID staff to examine markets and private sector entities, including local entities, to identify potential collaboration opportunities. The policy also commits us as an agency to engaging the private sector throughout the program cycle. And there is a strong focus on the local private sector, but collaboration with multinational private sector entities can also have ties to localization. So even when USAID collaborates with international firms, the collaboration almost always entails work with local partners as well. But while private sector engagement is core to what we do, we can do more to facilitate relationships with the local private sector. And many of the tools and approaches we are adopting in the context of our localization goals will help. And so these include a focus on making USAID more accessible to local actors, offering greater clarity on how to partner or collaborate with us, and then also making it easier to do so. And one example of the tools that we're using to do this, of course, is an online platform that we launched about 18 months ago, um, which is work with USAID.org. 
which really seeks to demystify the process of partnering with USAID by providing an, an easy to navigate platform with, with clear and accessible information about opportunities with USAID, as well as key documents that are translated into multiple languages. And the website also creates space for networking opportunities through a detailed partner directory and a sub opportunities page where organizations and firms can connect with one another. To facilitate partnerships with local actors, we're also looking to mainstream more phased procurement approaches, starting with short concept notes, for instance, rather than resource intensive full blown applications. And we're tailoring our outreach to local contexts, using local communications channels and expanding the use of local languages in our communications. And, and not just languages like Spanish or French, but, but also languages that are more widely spoken in communities. And we're also expanding collaborative approaches to program design including co-creation with local partners and with relevant stakeholders, including the private sector. And so today we have the opportunity to hear about two really great examples of locally led development through private sector engagement. And so it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers we have with us today. First, we'll hear from Cyrus Segby. Cyrus is the private sector project management specialist in the economic growth office uh, in the USAID mission in Liberia. And then we'll hear from Alvaro Viteri, who is the new projects development manager from Popoyan, an agriculture company who's based in, in Guatemala. And so with that, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Cyrus and looking forward to hearing uh, to, um, from both of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and, and thank you everyone for uh, being a part of this wonderful uh, event. Um, good afternoon from Liberia, West Africa. Um, good evening, wherever you are. Good morning, wherever you are. And as Sarah indicated, today I'm going to take you through processes um, that the USAID mission in Liberia adopted to ensure how we blend private sector engagement with that of our local led approach through our agribusiness activity. Thank you. And so um, you may have been opportune to perhaps go through uh, um, our own excerpts on the entire uh, page and RV links that try to build you through on some of the processes we followed to ensure that a lot of our engagement with the private sector uh, went beyond programs and, and how well we can tap into local expertise uh, to get this done. Can we move to the next slide, please? And so, um, Definitely, I'll, I'll take you through how our agribusiness business and incubator activities uh, kind of foster localization um, in our rural communities here in Liberia. But before then, let me just give you a little uh, glance, a snapshot of Liberia, the country called Liberia. Uh, for some of you who may not have heard about Liberia, um, I'll just give you a synopsis of what Liberia is. And so uh, Liberia is located in the west coast of Africa. Um, has, um, can you please stick to the next slide just for them to see and appreciate the view? Please, the next slide. Thank you. And so um, it's located in the west coast of Africa. Um, so it's in West Africa. The little red mark you see, um, that's Liberia. Um, has a population of small country, 5.2 million people, um, a GDP per capita of $676. Our poverty rate is around 28%. Um, roughly like $2.15 a day or less than that. Um, undernourishment stands around 38%. Um, in terms of agriculture dependency, uh, we are at 60%, and that's a complete paradox of the GDP contribution, which stands around 37%, and is um, largely from the extractive industry. And so most people that are involved in um, um, the agriculture side from food crops and what have you um, do not form part of this 37% because a lot of our intervention in Liberia in terms of agriculture productivity is actually subsistence farming. And so most of um, our rural communities actually invest in farming um, just to sustain themselves. Doing business, um, the East, doing business in Liberia is kind of very complex. Uh, we stand at 175. Um, amongst 190 countries in the world. And, and that tells you the kind of challenge that a lot of small businesses, large businesses go through. To get a business registered in Liberia takes almost around three to four months. 
Uh, everything is kind of centralized. And so you have to travel days from rural communities, come into the, um, the urban area to get your business registered. And that is not just overnight. So there hasn't been a kind of system put in place by government to ensure that uh, in terms of uh, formalizing um, businesses in Liberia has a kind of a smooth you know, process in place. We're hoping that we continue to work with the local government to ensure that we have something much more improved. Um, our main exports stand around iron ore, gold, uh, rubber, palm oil, uh, timber, cocoa, and those are the brackets that kind of contribute to the 37% for GDP. So against this background, having you know done a complete uh, screen of the sector, understanding um, the, the, the different barriers, the challenges, and what are the um, USAID Liberia together with, um, you know, with its technical team, um, move into a buy-in with the um, with ATR on, on the active business and um, incubation and development activity. Next slide, please. And so, why did we design the incubator activity? And one of the reasons was that we intended to um, contribute towards job creation in Liberia, especially for the youth for women-led businesses and what have you. The, the sector is kind of very small, it's narrow, um, mostly informal. And so to be able to give a kind of opportunity and provide the best insights for young people in Liberia, we um, designed the active business incubator, incubator activity. The next thing was to look at value addition. How can we encourage farmers to move from subsistence farming to commercial farming? And so in, to, in, in order to do that, we have to make sure we have um, available markets, um, try to make sure that we have value, add value to these products that were coming from on the farm. The next aspect we're looking at trade, uh, how can we do trade in locally and you know um, foreign trade? And that one of the ways is to um, work with these agri businesses to give them the necessary support they need them to be able to foster trade, um, having moved towards value addition. We also look at investments from various prospects to be equity investment and whatever you try to prepare these businesses so that they are investment ready, you know, to be able to engage with foreign partners and also compete with the international market. Um, the, the, the purpose also was to make sure that we strengthen small and startup entrepreneurs that are in the country. And so um, the activity was designed to address a lot of these concerns and these constraints uh, for Liberia. Next slide, please. Now, the active business incubator activity is like a $20 million buy-in with um, the Africa Trade and Investment um, Program, um, ATI for short. And one of the, 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 the purpose is to ensure that we have, you know, an activity that will develop the commercial active business sector. Um, and also to look at the various value chains. We didn't want to limit ourselves into specific value chains, but to kind of open it up so that we can get a lot of innovations coming up from farmers and active businesses in the sector. We also went beyond the USAID zone of influence, the zone of influence like geographical areas in country. Uh, we decided to cover the entire country with this activity because we felt that there could be, um, there are people out there who are also doing excellent work, doing a lot of great job, but do not have opportunities to, to a kind of you know, organize and um, formalize system that will give them the necessary support. What did we want to achieve? What we wanted to achieve was that um, looking at the potential in the um, agriculture sector and in the private sector, we wanted to unlock that potential. And that potential you know, uh, took us beyond what we look at value chain approach. Uh, how can we make sure that we uh, utilize and create a kind of opportunities for so that production could be enhanced and then there could be distribution, you know, um, and, and sales of these products once value is added. We also wanted to promote um, um, the agriculture entrepreneurs in Liberia. There are very good ideas coming from university students, coming from local businesses and what have you, but a lot of them do not have the kind of support needed to be able to scale up these ideas. Some wanted to diversify, some wanted to scale up their interventions. And so they needed a kind of push from that direction. We also intend to have and listen to all of the um, discussions and the barriers through our various engagements with the private sector. We, 
we saw it as an opportunity to be able to address the many constraints, improve the in, enabling environment that is by working with the government to be able to improve uh, examples for uh, doing business in Liberia, how can we improve on it to be able to create an opportunity so that local business to, businesses can have access to a system that will help to accelerate you know, um, their business registration in country and also to be able to um, accelerate growth of the private sector and the agri business front. So that's in a nutshell of what we wanted to achieve based on the design and the development of the agri business activity. Next slide, please. The, the activity um, brought together four different components. Um, components one and two look at um, providing opportunities to small businesses in, that in the informal sector um, and also startup businesses. And so we have the first component looking at um, business development service provision for um, small businesses, you know, that are not yet investment ready. And so we need to provide a kind of opportunity through an incubation process you know, that will help them to prepare them through um, the various mechanisms, either be it financial literacy or um, investment opportunities, and also um, organizational structure strengthening, and give them, uh, you know, um, through a kind of incubation process, provide the necessary support they need to and prepare them for pitch competitions. And so in component two, we we'll look at the pitch competitions where in these businesses are being prepared um, through six, to eight months period. And then they are now uh, ready to be able to market their products through pitching. And so um, we, we have what we call the, the, the pitch competition and the reverse pitch competition. So you have businesses that kind of market the ideas and then you have larger companies that come and present challenges they have so that these businesses can come and present, you know, uh, kind of solutions for these challenges, which of course is our reverse pitch competition. Component three, look at the former sector. Those who are ready, they are, they've, they've, had, um, they've operated before, they got access to assets and what have you, capital. And so they are prepared to co-invest in the activity. And then four, we just try to make sure that we have a unique system that will supervise and monitor the various activities that are ongoing. Next slide, please. Now, what were some of the barriers we encountered? Uh, one of the things through of our through our engagement was that hey, in terms of um, the concept node was just too long for USAID, and so then we needed to now think through and listen to a lot of the constraints that were out there and be able to reduce the concept notes. And so we formulated a concept note of just six pages with specific questions, you know, and some of the questions were like hey. Um, what are the challenges? Uh, what is it that you want to achieve? Um, what do you need the grant for? Uh, what's the present sales? Um, and also what will be your core investment of uh, matching capability? And so we reduced the, the, the concept to six pages and make it, made it much more friendly, you know, than what normal concepts to be. Then that helped them to, that would be able to help them to be able to contribute and, and provide and, and submit. But even with all that we did, there were still some challenges. Next slide, please. When the APS went live in quarter three of, of 2022, um, we, we realized that were just 18 applications. And if you look at the months in between, almost like five months, you know, there were just 18 applications. And one of the things we realized was that, hey, there were lack of awareness from the, um, to the public. Um, the, 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 um, the APS and the program statement was just, Posted on the ATR website. We also share it in, um, you know, Vera Agri Business Rooms. We send emails out to Agri Business um, institutions. We send emails out to government partners and what have you for them to circulate. But then we also realized that hey, the awareness was not much. Um, so that created the low submissions. It will also realize that there were um, inadequate knowledge of the application process. A lot of those who were interested and had desire to take advantage of the grant opportunity did not have much knowledge, much knowledge on the application process. Um, internet access was also an issue. There was also the issue of the mindset. Everyone thinks that, hey, once you see it put out an opportunity, they already have organizations that they have identified, pre-identified, you know, to, to, to give them these kinds of opportunities. So 
there was a complete mindset and a kind of reluctance in uh, submitting and taking advantage of this opportunity. Having realized it, we believed that we felt that we had to innovate and, and to be able to attract a lot of people. And this is how we push our localization agenda. Next slide, please. And so with all of the backdrop and all of the understanding, getting the barriers and what we, we move into what we refer to as a road show. To do that, we quickly recruited a local firm um, called Talinshal Africa. And we worked with them to be able to develop jingles, develop flyers, vinyls, promos, you know, in our local languages, you know, and also simple labyrinth in nature. The essence of that was to make sure we created the best awareness, generate local interest, and then reach out to the local community so that we can, you know, adequately, you know, uh, engage with them, listen to what the, the issues were, and be able to get, you know, get in a process of get um, getting their questions and responding to them in a more formal way. It also created the opportunity to be able to engage with them face to face, and that was a very exciting event. Next slide, please. And so when, when the local firm was, was recruited, we embarked on the roadshow in four counties, uh, what we refer to maybe as regions or states in your area. We have 15 of those here. Um, the local firm together with USAID and ATI, you know, um, we reached out with this roadshow. We had a van wherein we mounted speakers, and that then, you know, kind of went through the principal streets, the cities, the streets of the county we found ourselves, you know, with the kind of awareness, you know, and then a lot of people got the information and they decided to attend. So just from that awareness, we were able to attract about 335 uh, SMEs, agribusinesses, farmers, and what have you, you know, to an indoor event. And that kind of created you know, much more excitement. We also use the local radio station. We use Facebook feeds and what have you to be able to disseminate the information. The firm also um, would set up service centers, you know, through the local government institutions at the county level. Um, and that service center was intended to be able to cater for and respond to questions that were coming in. The firm also set up internet, you know, free internet um, opportunities, Wi-Fi, at the various service centers so that um, those IT businesses that never had access to internet connectivity to utilize that system, you know, utilize the facility to be able to submit. And so they kind of guided them in submission. One thing we were very critical about was that they were not to move into packaging the application for them. Uh, once the applications were prepared and, write and, and, you know, and ready for submission, they visited the service center and utilized the internet. Um, facility. Um, we also established local numbers that they could easily reach, a friendly number that was very easy to remember. And, and, and so that created, and what it did, what the Indo program did was that it brought us face to face with these companies. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, um, trying to, hey, we live in the comfort zone, leaving our comfort zone and coming down to be able to listen more to you, to be able to uh, respond to some of the questions, the concerns you have. A lot of them, you know, had issues with, hey, lack of, lack of um, opportunity to financial, you know, uh, access. They also had um, connectivity issues. And there was a, just a general question asked them in the room. And the, uh, in Liberia, we kind of, you know, very, very moved with um, trying to um, play what we call the diversity visa, which is a rotary uh, that everyone plays in Liberia. And, you know, who wants to travel perhaps to the U.S., you know, and, and what have you. And so the question was that, hey, when you are playing your diversity visa, what means do you use? And they all said, hey, we find internet. So, hey, this is an opportunity that has come to you. And so you have to take advantage. But nevertheless, we still went through. And I would just want to just add a little bit portion of that promo um, so that you just listen to some of the wordings. I mean, it's going to be difficult perhaps to understand because that's just in the really, really simple library in English that we use so that these local um, communities could, could listen to. Can you please... Um, Air, air, air the communities. My people, you say Labiro, God is good news. 
If you in this agriculture business, then you need to listen Google or you tell someone you know that into agriculture. You say Labiro is giving all grand opportunity and training for people to start this agriculture business through incubation. If your business is new and you are a Labirin with good so, business idea related you. to so, agriculture, so or you was actually aired on with the box you see in the photo mounted with speakers through the principal streets the local radio stations and, and what have you. And so um, that Mexican, you know, created a lot of attraction and attention and a lot of people kind of participated in the next five years. Having gone through all of these, um, we, we, we were excited with, with the outcome. Next slide, please. We were excited with the outcome. And, and then what the world showed did for us is that it kind of, from 18 grant applications, you know, from the, the first submissions, we got like 148 applications, which of course went beyond our expectation. The excitement was that at least a lot of people got to understand how to apply. They took interest in the, in the grant process. They understood that, hey, um, organizations that have never worked with USC before could take advantage of this. And with this kind of result, you know, we, we kind of, we excited from the first batch of applicants we received, we were able to go through that process and 13 of them, you know, went through uh, capacity assessment and co-creation now is on, ongoing. The next batch of 148, we are bowed down to review. Um, there will be some of them who perhaps um, do not fit for direct grant based on the amounts that they are requesting. Because if you are requesting from $10,000 to $50,000, definitely you we, we send you straight to the incubation, which of course I'm gonna be talking about right after. And then once you are above that amount, we now put you into the direct grants bracket. So that is the next step we're going to now follow through to be able to review these applications. And the good news, the good news is that, hey, we give them feedback. Even if you do not qualify, you know, if you didn't make it through, we kind of provide a feedback to you why you didn't make it through. And we encourage you to reapply once the grant window reopens. But for now, we've closed the grant window. We try now to review all of these concepts and you know, uh, definitely at a certain point in time in, in, in the year, we're gonna be reopening and then create a lot of more new awareness and giving feedback to these um, applicants. Next slide, please. Now, having, having gone through all of the first, you know, localization approach and with the successes gained and, you know, the excitement and the interest and what I view from local partners, our second component, um, which is the first and the second that you saw, which of course is the incubation aspect of this activity, we decided to innovate something new. We didn't just sit in the comfort of our offices and develop the request for proposals. We decided to have another engagement with firms, local firms that have carried on this work before. And so we convened a kind of session to pull together firms that have worked in the space in terms of incubation across the country. Next slide, please. And so we, we, we gather a lot of these firms um, we, we kind of co-created the entire request for proposal with them because these were local actors who understood the dynamics, who understood the local context, who understood um, the challenges out there, who understood the, the local business context. And so we kind of co-created the entire RFP, which of course was very, very new for them. <laughs> they hadn't seen that before in Liberia, but hey, USAID could come and co-create with us the request for proposal. Um, there were over 15, 20 of them that attended the session. Um, so um, we, we, we tap into their local knowledge, what exists, what, was, what is now existing, what is it that they needed to see come forth from this kind of process. And, and so they, they presented key insights into um, the RFP, and which of course we kind of incorporated a lot of their information into the RFP. Next slide, please. Now, what, what that did was that, what that did was that um, um, together with the co-creation in terms of the 15 geographical areas, the 15 counties, or you call it 15 states in Liberia, we kind of divided them into three major zones. And so they were able to propose to us how we should be able to divide the 15 counties. And so we tapped into that because we felt that it was very, very fair enough to be able to tap into it. They also propose um, the, 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 the cohorts in terms of the, the duration of the cohorts um, that should go forth. Um, they propose that. 
um, and and so they, they also provided us information of the structure um you know of the entire incubation um out of the 12 submissions that came forth we had three vibrant uh, local companies emerging as subcontractors one of the things we also encouraged for was to um, um, push them and, and encourage them to create what they call consortiums um, because we, we, we wanted to make sure that they started to create a system and adapt a system to be able to work together, to be able to share lessons learned and, and what have you. So there were a lot of consortiums that came in and three of those firms emerged um, victorious. Next slide, please. The process has begin has begun. Um, we've we've kicked off the incubation process and 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 what have you. And we are excited because the the interest has grown from across the country. A lot of people have been reaching out to these companies. The official kickoff has been done. We are excited to see results coming up. We are excited to see what you know local uh, companies in Liberia are capable of. We we kind of did a lot of background check on them. I mean they. They've done similar work before. Uh, one of the challenges they had was that they were unable to pre-finance these activities. And so we developed kind of the contract we developed was based on milestone. And so uh, we were kind of very flexible to be able to get milestones that they could achieve. And once the milestones are achieved, definitely they are provided with payments to be able to carry on the work. And 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 so um we this is a test case for Liberia. We, we are excited um, to take the risk. Um, we believe that for too long, we've implemented through our traditional implementing partners. For just too long, we've, we've, been, we've um, not been able to deepen our intervention with local communities and local partners. And I will leave you with this wonderful quote that I love so much from Albert Einstein that says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. USAID has been in Liberia for 60 years. Within 60 years, we've, we've been trying to see what impact have we made? Um, do we still want to continue with our traditional local partners? Do we still want to continue planning for the people? It is about time that we change our you know, strategy from planning for to planning with, because when you plan with, definitely you get to understand the challenges you are able to overcome those challenges and to be able to sustain development and have impact we need to localize our approach uh, let me say thank you i'm going to pause here and then wait for your questions and answer but we are excited uh, with with this and the mission wants to see how well we can skill up on our intervention to this line thank you Thank you so much, Cyrus. And there was so much uh, important content in your presentation there. I, I just to highlight a couple of things that I heard that I think are just really so meaningful and hopefully to have uh, more discussion on as we go forward with this conversation is, you know, really being intentional about, you know, how you're reaching a variety of audiences to um, expanding the different types of communication channels you use through roadshows, for example. And I think, you know, if you look at that, those before and after figures that you that you put up in terms of the number of applicants, you know, really speak so strongly to the need to be able to think about how to reach out in different kinds of ways. Um, the co-design process of the RFP as well, uh, reaching out to local firms who have done this kind of work before, you know, allowing USA to sort of check its own assumptions and, and what the project should look like and the program should look like and, and tapping into those experiences and expertise as well. So thank you so much. Um, looking forward to more conversation. But now I'd like to turn over to Alvaro Viteri for an example from Popoyan in Guatemala. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Sarah, for the for the introduction and Cyrus for that great presentation. It's great to to be here and uh, to be able to share with you something that we're doing here in, in Guatemala. So we're currently uh, in Guatemala and a small. Basically, we are Popoyan. We are a private sector company and uh, we are it's our main business is agriculture. Right. So we have a variety of solutions for every single step of the agriculture value chain. Uh, and for the last 45 years, we have, had, uh, we have developed uh, relationships with farmers and other companies uh, as well that are in the agriculture industry. And we have basically co-designed or, or, or what we should say solutions that will uh, serve them to basically solve their problems that they have uh, on their fields, right? 
So we work with smallholder farmers, we work with medium and large farmers, and we have technologies that we uh, validate uh, in the different levels of farmers at the, and different areas of Guatemala. Our model of working is based on a shared value business model. So we try to basically solve different social uh, problems such as uh, uh, the, the lack of income from the different people and how we can increase their yields so that people have more incomes. Uh, and basically everything that it uh, is related to uh, chronic malnutrition, how they can use those funds to invest in improving their livelihoods. Um, being, I think being a local company, we have the infrastructure to share knowledge and technologies with farmers. And we um, basically saw the opportunity on how to scale our shared value business model uh, to other areas of Guatemala, specifically in the Western Highlands. Uh, with a partnership uh, with USA. So um, throughout the project, we are looking for impacting uh, around 55,000 smallholder farmers uh, and around uh, 30,000 families uh, in the Western Highlands. So Popoyana is a local private sector organization. Basically, it's a platform that USA Guatemala is able to leverage uh, in a technical and local knowledge and uh, we can we are able to identify farmers we are able to identify local partners and local private sector actors that we think are key players uh, for the success of the project and how we can basically uh, have pretty good good and sustainable results i would say and um i think one of the most important uh, approaches here is that we have an investment approach right we focus on sustainability and being a private sector company uh, as well, we need to look for, a, basically for us, sustainability means profit in the long term, right? So uh, another important part, which is tied to this part of investment is um, all the private sector, well, well, a big part of the private sector investment uh, is made by Popoyan with Popoyan private sector funds, right? So we have invested in, in an uh, application, which is called AgriConnecta. That application basically is a, a tool for the farmers that empowers them to make better decisions. Uh, and, and I will go into more detail of that uh, in a moment. And as well, the Centers for Modern Agriculture, Prosperity and Opportunities uh, that are centers that basically have solutions for the smallholder farmers where they can come learn. Um, there, it has a behavior change strategy that is pretty well done as well. And then farmers can replicate those technologies in their farms and basically access those technologies as well. So coming back to the investment approach and, and the investment that, that Popoyan has been doing in the project, uh, we could say that basically a company will not invest where it doesn't see a long-term return on investment, right? So if we are investing funds from Popoyan and as well from USAID, we're basically that filter that says, okay, we're going to invest where it's going to be sustainable, right? And that, I think it's something that a local player and specifically a local private sector player has um, um, in Guatemala, in, in our case. Um, we also have a, a co-investment fund with the private sector. And uh, an example of that uh, is, uh, for example, an association of coffee farmers called Asobagri. They needed a collection center for coffee because they needed more capacity of storage because they were adopting newer, newer technologies and having more yields um, in, their, uh, in the fields of their farmers, right? They were also trying to get more farmers to, to the program and basically they needed that, that capacity. They, they have the knowledge, they have the market, they have basically everything. They just needed uh, some funds to be able to co-invest and basically leverage the, the public sector and be able to co-invest and make their own um, a collection center for, for coffee, right? Well, increase the capacity of the collection center for coffee. So here we start to see a little difference of, let's say the traditional way of implementing a, a, a cooperation projects. And we have, we shifted from an implementer focus which is a, what we call, or we could say it's the traditional way of implementing project to a partner focused. 
And uh, basically the partner focus is, we see that both institutions are at the same level, right? So we see Popoyan has funds to invest, USAID has funds to invest. We sit down, we co-design what we're gonna do, and then we basically go and, in, and invest. Uh, and that's what we call a sustainable investment, right? So uh, shifting from an implementer focus to a partner focus, it's I think one of the key takeaways. Um, as well, I think Popoyan being 40 years in the market understands the needs of the small scale farmers and basically knows how to make those investments in a sustainable way. We also have a last mile delivery approach and that means how we're able to get those technologies closer to the farmers at a competitive price, right? Because most of the, of the farmers are located in areas that are pretty far away and I believe in Africa, in uh, Liberia, Liberia, as Cyrus was mentioning, the the areas of intervention are pretty rural and pretty far away from the urban areas, right? So it's very expensive to get those technologies to those areas, and with a last mile delivery ap approach and basically uh, leveraging the uh, all the amount of farmers and the volume of of demand that they have, basically we're able to get those technologies to them at a competitive price. And as well, we're able to engage other private sector companies that can leverage the platform of the project to get to those farmers, right? And our approach with those partners is for them, it's a newer market that they can develop, right? Um, usually smallholder farmers are a, a market that consume, if you have each of them by themselves, the amount of consumption that they have of any technology is very low. So for a private sector company to get to those areas is very expensive, right? But if we get all of them together and then we, we they basically do like a collective negotiation and that's what we do through AgriConnecta as well, then it becomes uh, feasible, right? Getting a little bit more into detail so to the co-design, because I think that's uh, one of the most important um, like uh, topics that uh, this presentation is about. We have had co-design at all levels, right? So we have had co-design at the level, at a very high level between both institutions, Popoyan and USAID. And that means, uh, let's say at a program level, right? So overall, what we're gonna do. But we have had also co-design with our private sector partners specifically in the private sector co-investment fund that we're working with 80 different local organizations. We have had as well co-design with Popoyan and the farmers, right? And how we, we can uh, basically design the best solutions for them and of Popoyan with local farmers, right? With local players, I'm sorry. So at the end, I think the co-design goes at all different levels and basically it's something that has helped us to, to be successful in the implementation uh, of the project. And I think something very important to highlight here is that the co-design does not end with a final proposal uh, ready and the agreements with USAID signed. Uh, so I co the co-design, what we see and what, what we think it has been very important for, for the good results that we're having is it keeps on going throughout the life of the project, right? It's a continuous validation of the model uh, throughout the five, uh, and now we are uh, gonna be working for 10 years with USAID. And, um, and basically how we do it, uh, we have a close monitoring and pause and reflection exercises with USAID that basically help us to make any changes when needed. And uh, we could say it's a continuous fine tuning of what we're doing, right? And uh, we are able to to like change track. We are able to innovate. We are able to stay uh, pretty focused on what we're doing, but trying to uh, have a continuous improvement on the methodologies that we have. Then um, I think as well that part of co-design that we were mentioning before, uh, the farmers play a very important role, right? So let's say what's the voice of the farmers in the program, right? And basically. What we do is uh, we tailor make solutions for specifically each of the farmers that we're working with. And we go, we see what they have, we see what they are missing or what they could improve. And we build on everything that they have already. So we don't go and say, okay, what you have does not work. 
because that it's not our way of, of getting there. So the way of engaging them is, okay, we're doing this correctly. Let's try to improve this. Let's try to adopt this. Uh, for example, an irrigation system that they wouldn't have or uh, infrastructure for macro tunnels uh, to have a protected agriculture, for example. So we try to build on what they already have. We try to build on, on the markets that they have. And uh, we try to build on, on basically taking him as the key pillar of the, all the technologies that we're gonna uh, implement together, together with him. And that's the only way that we can uh, engage him as well, right? We, we try to change our focus with the farmers and uh, instead of calling them beneficiaries of the project, uh, basically they are a client of the project, right? So if we talk only about beneficiaries, going with a beneficiary is okay, I'm helping you, right? And, and this is you, this is what you're gonna do. And, and beneficiary, it still is like from someone that is in a higher level, trying to help the smallholder farmer, right? So our way of working is we see them as clients of the project, right? So we go and then we co-design, we work together with him. And what we think is by the time that the farmer is willing to co-invest in adopting that decision, or that technology, uh, we feel very happy and proud because that's the way, uh, that's the only way and that we can measure that he learned, that he changed his be behavior and he's willing to invest in that new technology and as well that he will take care of that technology, right? So um, everything that, that we do with the farmers is, is very, uh, let's say uh, we exchange ideas, we build on what they have and, and basically that helps us uh, to, to have a successful implementation on the agriculture part of the project, but as well in the other parts of the project, which include uh, access to markets, include uh, reducing chronic malnutrition rates as well in, in the areas, and uh, working with climate smart practices as well. Why we think uh, localization is more sustainable? Um, so we think local businesses are focuses, local businesses are focused on the long term. And let's say if a business is investing uh, in his business model, so he wants to stay forever, right? And, uh, and if we go with local businesses of the region that are investing, then they are the best ones who know already the technical solutions that their uh, farmers need. They have been working in, the, in those solutions for a long time uh, behind. They have investment done in research and development because they know what the farmers need, right? And um, so working with, with local businesses basically uh, assures that sustainability of the project, right? Versus a traditional way of implementing a, a, a project which has like a beginning and an end, right? So what happens after five years of a project, the project finishes and basically goes away, right? So working with local businesses, we try to, to, to incentivize them to, to increase productivities. We try to invest uh, with them to access new markets. And basically once the project ends, those actors that were part of the project and have a business and a sustainable profit, they are the ones who stay, uh, and, uh, who stay in the implementation. And basically for the long-term, they keep doing the work that we're doing uh, as a project as well. And um, uh, I think we're running out of time. So basically just uh, some closing uh, remarks. Uh, what we have talked about here uh, in this conversation is what we call a shared value business model, right? We have seen that the objectives of Popoyan, a private sector company, and the objectives of USAID, a public uh, sector, um, basically are the same. We just use different terms for referring to some things and we just use different ways of, of, uh, of implementation. But basically what we did in this partnership is we aligned the, all of those uh, objectives into one project, into one strategy. And I think that has been the successful uh, results that we are, what, that we're doing. And I think USAID Guatemala has been as well pioneering as well, this kind of public and private partnerships. And I would say the success the, that we have had as a project and the su successful results uh, that we have, it's the merit of this partnership that we have with USAID. So none of us could have done it uh, by itself. So 
I think it's a, a great uh, relationship. And one last uh, key takeaway that I think it's uh, very important is that we as a private sector company do not see the project as part of a corporate social responsibility project, right? We see the project as a sustainable business model of shared value uh, with a long-term impact. So with this, uh, I give the word again to Sarah and thank you very much to all. Thank you so much, Alvaro. There was so much um, rich material in your, in, your, in your presentation there, you know, reflecting on just the value of the partnership, right? When you have, you know, both USAID and Popoyan have funds to invest, so how to look for complementarities and then how also can Popoyan sort of bring its comparative advantage and understanding sort of this network of, of markets and players and, and opportunities for long-term sustainability that you've been so focused on in your work that you do. Um, also, your thoughts on the expansive nature of co-creation and the importance of that, thinking about co-design with a range of different kinds of groups and individuals and types from, from farmers to, to USAID itself. Um, and also your point about co-creation throughout the lifespan of the project is really important um, for looking for these sort of continuous opportunities for, I think you said, fine tuning, validation for learning, um, and also reflecting on, on, on the assets based versus the deficits based approach that, that you mentioned in terms of thinking about, you know, where do you see um, successes and opportunities and knowledge to build upon um, rather than the approach of, of, of changing the way that, that some of these, um, these, these agricultural, agricultural entrepreneurs are working. And also I just wanna highlight too, the importance of language that you highlighted. I think this is such a point to underscore, right? Uh, thinking about clients versus beneficiaries, but, but you're exactly right in that you cannot have a co-design or a co-creation process um, with a mindset of benefactor, beneficiary, that, that those two things don't fit together. So, so really appreciate your points there. I will open up uh, now to questions and answers. We've had a number of good questions in the chat um, and let me pull those together here. So um, the first question, uh, the first question is, is, a, is a definition question and I'll just run through that really quickly. Um, uh, Andrea or Andrea asked, how is the private sector defined? And I can just point quickly to our private sector engagement policy, which um, refers to the private sector as you know, for-profit commercial entities and affiliated foundations, financial institutions, investors and intermediaries, business associations and cooperatives, you know, micro, small, medium and large enterprises, uh, regional multinational businesses and for-profits that generate sustainable income. I can just drop that in the chat, and but then let's uh, look at questions to the presenters. The first one I have here, um, oh, sorry, there was one that was answered here, is um, a question for you, Cyrus. Um, uh, there was a question about what is the pathway from incubation to scale? So looking at it from a macroeconomic perspective, how would this agribusiness incubator scale and how are you leveraging technology as part of that? So over to you, Cyrus. Thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you, Snola, for that brilliant question. In terms of scale, um, um, definitely the agribusiness incubator um, is actually preparing small and emerging agribusinesses who are in the informal sector. Um, to be able to scale up and transition to the formal sector. Um, they will also be prepared in terms of making sure that they become much more investment ready. They are prepared to take, take on new opportunities, be it maybe to run APS because they will have now prepared themselves in terms of the financial management skills, in terms of their organizational structures, uh, looking at their profit ratios, looking at, you know, in terms of um, um, their, their, their whole structure of making sure that they are on a path of a kind of business um, venture, looking at more profit-oriented enterprising, bigger revenue streams that will help them, you know, to be able to promote um, their business ventures in their various areas of, 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 of opportunity. Um, in terms of um, technology, definitely, this is something we, we trying to encourage. Um, we, we are not detecting on what they need to do. There has to be a business case for whatsoever they want to do. We were excited to see some concepts coming in of organizations that want to use technology to reach out and you know to, and be able to market the local produce. Um, those are innovations we're looking for. So we're kind of open to the very innovations that will come, but we are not detecting to what kind of business they should venture into. Um, the incubators, um, the incubators are also going to work with those incubators. They have their own structural um, 
you know, methodology and whatever they want to follow. So definitely we allow them and give them the, the leverage to be able to do what is best to get the media results we want. Thank you so much, Cyrus. Um, the next question I have is um, really for, for, both, um, for both of our speakers today. Um, and, and this is a question about uh, sustainability. This, Alvaro, this is something that you mentioned in your remarks in particular, and your, your, the lens that you take towards long-term profitability as, as sustainability. And so there was a question about, you know, uh, for, for both of you, and Alvaro, I'll turn to you first, about you know, what is the plan for becoming sustainable over time? What is the sustainability lens that you take to your work? And then Al Alvaro, after you uh, answer that question, I'll turn back to Cyrus for your thoughts with respect to the incubator project as well. Thank you, Sarah. So I think uh, since the conception of the project, uh, us being a private sector company, we, we see every single uh, disimbursement that we do, it has to add value towards an investment, right? So uh, everything that we do in the project and as well through the, the partners that we have has to do with business models, right? And um, specifically in our case, in the investment that Popoyan has been doing, that the four centers for rural agriculture, for modern agriculture that Popoyan has a basically investment invested in the infrastructure, all of them have a business model, right? So th that business model is focused on smallholder holder farmers and they supply, a, for example, seedlings for smallholder farmers that a, before the existence of the project that were really expensive to get to the smallholder farmers in good qualities, right? So now they can buy their a small seedlings at a very competitive price. And that's, uh, I would say, a state-of-the-art technology uh, that they have access to, right? So that center has a business model that basically um, uh, will stay profitable for the long term uh, and uh, will keep on attending that market of smallholder farmers, right? Then with the par partners that we have, uh, we try to inc incentivize them to bring their existing business models to the areas of uh, the project, right? So they usually would have a business model that is not uh, currently attending smallholder farmers from the Western Highlands, but through the project, we're able to incentivize them to invest in, the, uh, in that area, right? So they will not invest in, a, the, in any construction or any uh, infrastructure that they would need in the Western Highlands if they would not see a long-term profit on that, right? So, all their business models, we try to uh, incentivize them through the project so that they come and attend the smallholder farmer segment in those, those areas. So basically answering uh, specifically, uh, everything has to do with uh, long-term investment and return on investment for the partners that we have. Thank yeah, you, Alvaro. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead for your thoughts. So, and just picking up on that, the agribusiness activity was actually designed uh, to be able to sustain interventions through um, profit-making companies. And so if you went for the APS, that is the bigger companies that are already doing similar work, doing social work, you just want to scale up. Perhaps you want to improve, improve your branding. You want to in, in, in improve your quality. You want to tap into the international market. You want to also diversify, create river revenue streams, or perhaps you want to develop new products you know, and so um, once you are into the area, um, and that's why we also put um, co-investments because you have to put your money, your mouth, your money to where your mouth is. And once you are also investing in it, definitely you kind of very cognizant of the challenges, the rigs and what have you, and be able to sustain. And so we move away a lot of monetary, um, trying to make sure that we take you through all of our entire due diligence process. Um, even though with the flexibilities and what have you, we still firm on how we approach it. In, for the incubators, the subcontractors that want, um, definitely they are now looking at new dynamics. Hey, uh, one of the things that was discussed is there is a challenge of private companies who have never worked with music before to get their unique identi um, entity identification number. Um, that is a challenge in country. And I'm sure maybe other countries have similar challenges. Now they want to go further. They want to now see how well they can asking us to provide a kind of training, you know, that we help them to be able to um, create that kind of avenue to support organizations, you know, who want to 
hold that file or bring out who want to tap into grants from other opportunities. So they are looking at it more as a business approach. And the message that we gave out clearly to everyone that attended the kickoff event was that look at the incubator as a business. It's not, you know, you know, like a you know a project or what have you, but it is a business. And if you are coming in, you have to come in with that business mindset to be able to either maximize profit or to be able to make profit and have a very good structure that is sustainable intervention. So that's is that's our kind of sustainability mechanism and model we, we adapt. Thank you very much, Cyrus. Um, unfortunately, we're coming to our time here. As always, there is so much more discussion that we could have um, about these two particular examples and about the examples in general. But I just wanna thank so much, Cyrus Segbi, Alvaro Viteri for sharing your time and your expertise with us. We will be following closely these projects to see them evolve. But I think the key message you know, that you are leaving us with is not only you know, your thoughts about, you know, how a locally led development lens, you know, can be done to, with private sector engagement, but but that it really must be done if, if our goal is to think about sort of sustainable uh, long term profitability and growth as well. Um, thank you again to the AgriLinks team um, and to the USAID colleagues at the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security. This uh, event will be posted on the AgriLinks website, so do feel free to share it with others. Um, and we thank you all for your time and for your engagement today. Great questions that came through. And, uh, and, and thanks very much. We look forward to, to seeing you all again. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.